there everyone and welcome to Gassy Vampire. I am your host Arwen Starsong and here we deep dive and delve into all that is mysterious and macabre. If that sounds like your jam then please give that like button a nice little love tap and do not forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to summon your deepest fears. Today we cover a Thanksgiving story fitting as we're all preparing for that lovely turkey dinner. However, this would turn into a meal to die for. Today's case is the story of Omaima Nelson. So not much is known about Omaima during her childhood and when she was growing up, but this was all of the information that I could gather. Omaima was born around 1968 in Egypt near the Sudanese border. She grew up in a rural area in poverty and her household was unstable. Her father was cruel and physically and sexually abusive toward her mother and her. She also claimed that her brother was abusive to her as well, though it's not really specified in what way he was abusive. It is also said that in her youth, she actually underwent female genital mutilation. Now, if you know nothing about FGM, as we'll call it, you should at least know that it is a very painful and traumatic experience to anyone who experiences it. So basically what it involves is people use tools to in some way mutilate the female anatomy so that they cannot feel sexual pleasure. It is also said to be very excruciatingly painful when a woman attempts to be intimate, which really sucks. There's also several types of FGM, some just being minor cuts and mutilations to the anatomy itself, and even types where they just sew all of it shut. It is just god-awful, and it really sucks that it's still practiced in some parts of the world today. Though I will add that recently in a couple of countries it was banned, which is awesome, good, because it is freaking disgusting and no one should have to go through that experience ever. Apparently, poor Omaima had to experience it when she was only seven years old. Let that sink in for a moment. Eventually, and thankfully, Omaima's mother got the courage to gather up Omaima and all of their things and relocate to another part of the country. They decided to flee to a part of Cairo called the City of the Dead, which was kind of a rural area in the slums where it was surrounded by cemeteries and graveyards. At one point, it was said to be a very peaceful place for people, but over the years it would devolve, and so this is where they ended up. Once again, in poverty, and doing what they could to survive. At 18, Omaima met and fell in love with an American oil worker. It's said that Omaima's mom actually encouraged the relationship as they both kind of saw it as a way to get out of the horrible poverty that they were suffering and maybe start setting their life back on track. It was actually upon her insistence that the two decided to get married. And as soon as his job was done in the area, they would relocate back to his home in Texas and start their married life. Unfortunately, however, the marriage wouldn't last and Omaima was left to her own devices in a foreign country, not really knowing English, and once again having to do whatever it took to survive. This would lead her to become kind of a drifter, drifting from place to place, taking odd jobs such as housekeeping, being a nanny, sometimes even modeling gigs. Her drifter lifestyle also led to her having to do petty theft in order to make a living. Using her good looks and her charm, she would seduce men, moving in with them and becoming involved with them very quickly, and then using it as a chance to steal and spend their money. And then when she was confronted about it, she tended to just rob them and leave. This would unfortunately become her main source of support, and she was also accused of threatening her ex-boyfriend Robert Hansen by tying him up to a couch and then pointing a shotgun at him before robbing him and leaving again. Eventually, she ended up in Costa Mesa, California, and this is where her story actually begins. One night in a bar, which is usually where she hung out to try to find other victims to rob, she met Bill Nelson while playing a game of pool. Their meeting would cause a very fast 
turn of events that would end up deadly. But before we get into said events, we gotta talk about Bill just a little bit at least. Sadly, there wasn't really much information on Bill, and that's sad because he's the victim in this situation. But from the information that I could find, he used to be a pilot. In 1984, he actually got convicted of possessing marijuana and spent four years in a penitentiary for doing so. After serving his four years and finally getting his parole, Bill would get a job with a company called Cannon Mortgage and he would try to get his life back on track. When he met Omaima, Bill was 56 and Omaima herself was 23. But there was just something about Omaima that struck him, apparently, because after only a few days of getting to know each other, the two would get hitched. They apparently celebrated their honeymoon and a ranch that Bill's brother owned in Texas. Bill also seemed to just be stoked to have such a beautiful, charming young woman by his side. And he was very stoked for that Thanksgiving that was going to be coming in the next few weeks. He wanted to introduce her to all of his family, you know? Omaima, however, thought things differently. She claimed that in the three to four weeks that they were married, Bill sexually and physically abused her. She also said that Bill had become a very different man, pimping her out to random people to get his hands on some rent money, cash, and even at one point, a car. Now, as Thanksgiving rolled around and Bill started making plans for the Thanksgiving dinner and inviting his family, his family just didn't seem all too happy about their marriage, especially his daughter, Margaret, who downright refused to even show up and even got angry with him. Little did she and the entirety of Bill's family know this would be the last time they got a chance to speak to Bill, as the turn of events that I'm about to discuss turned deadly. Now, it isn't known if people actually showed up to the dinner. I couldn't really find any information on that, but Omaima recalls that Bill was getting abusive and nasty with her again, and she had just had enough. So she grabbed the nearest object to her, it being a lamp, and smashed his head in with it to try to get him off her. In her mind, it was too late to go back after she had done this, as he got really angry with her and started coming at her a lot harder. So she grabbed a pair of scissors and started to drive it into his skull and into his stomach. When the scissors failed to subdue Bill, she grabbed a clothing iron and repeatedly once more bashed his head in with it, breaking the iron in her hand from the sheer force that she used. Think about that for a second. Irons in the 90s, were really, really heavily built. Those were heavy ass things to pick up. And the fact that she bashed his head so hard that the iron broke in her hand tells many people that this was a lot of force being used in an effort to subdue him. This tells me that it was rage. It was anger. It was pent up feelings. Something in her just snapped. Unfortunately, from here, things would only get worse. When Bill was finally dead, Omaima knew that she had a really heavy task on her hands. She now had this body that she had to get rid of. So, she got to work. She started to take Bill apart, dismembering him, and she threw some parts of Bill down the garbage disposal, which the neighbors apparently recalled hearing going, And if you guys know garbage disposals, those things are not quiet. If you walk by somebody's house with it, if they had a window open especially, you're gonna be able to hear that from at least a few feet away. Omaima would cut off his hands, frying them in oil in order to get rid of fingerprint evidence. She also would put his head in the freezer so that she could freeze him for later and pull out all of his teeth so that he wasn't identifiable through dental records. Doing what she did would render him unrecognizable. So that way if she ever got caught, they would at least not know who the heck it was. And then, kinda for the hell of it, she would castrate him in her own spiteful revenge. Because yeah, murdering, castrating, and mutilating your husband to the point where he's unrecognizable is better than divorce, right? But trust me, from here, it only gets worse. She stuffed some parts in bags as she couldn't fit everything down in the garbage disposal. And then what she did next was, excuse me. According to the court psychiatrist, Omaima accounted, <clears throat> she accounted taking apart his ribs preparing them restaurant style with barbecue sauce, throwing him in the oven, and then consuming him. Yeah, she ate him. She ate him and she liked it. Even going as far as to recount how sweet 
his flesh tasted. There was also one psychiatrist that said that she prepared herself for this mutilation of his body by putting on red shoes, red lipstick, and a red hat. I don't know how true that is, because that kind of just sounds a bit outrageous for any type of this. Who has time for that, really? Anyways, getting rid of a dead human body is a lot of hard work. The dead are heavy, especially during rigor mortis. And can you imagine being Omaima, trying to get rid of a large man like Bill all by herself? Dead humans are heavy, dude. Like, live humans are heavy, but dead humans? Probably 10 times more heavy. Now, from the information that I could gather about Omaima, it's said that she was near six feet tall. I'm not sure how much she weighed because I didn't really specify, but you know, she's a pretty tall woman. I'm pretty sure that she was probably pretty strong, but even then, after a while of messing around with a dead body and moving stuff around, it has to get heavy and tiresome. And needless to say, Omaima was tired. So, she would enlist some help. Omaima drove to an ex-boyfriend's house using Bob's 1975 red Corvette. And the person recalls Omaima pulling up. He's never seen this car before. And she appeared at the door just looking exhausted. Omaima would go on to offer this ex-boyfriend $75,000 in order to help her get rid of Bill's body. Of course, the ex-boyfriend, not wanting to get involved and probably kind of wanting to get a little bit of revenge, would go to immediately call the authorities on Omaima. She tried to flee, but then she was pulled over by cops. On December 2nd, 1991, she was detained by police because when they pulled her over, behold, they found the body parts. Because the body was so dismembered, Police and authorities were unfortunately unable to initially recognize that it was Bill until he didn't show up to work on Monday after the Thanksgiving holiday. When police finally searched the house, they would walk into a horrific scene. Body parts just everywhere, a head in the frickin' freezer, hands being fried. Can you imagine walking into something like that? And then parts being mixed with Thanksgiving turkey. It was like she was trying to disguise the body of Bill as a Thanksgiving dinner leftover plate. Police would also inform that there was about 130 pounds of Bill missing. Gee, I wonder where that went. The trial was almost a full year later on December 1st of 1992. And during the court proceedings, she would go on to tell about her traumatic childhood, her father's abuse, her brother's abuse, growing up in poverty, her FGM, and also about all of the alleged abuse that Bill apparently made her go through. She also stated that sex in general was just traumatic and very painful for her because of her FGM. And the fact that Bill kept subjecting her to it was just traumatic in itself, and she had finally had enough. On January 12th, 1993, Omaima Nelson would be found guilty of second degree murder and then be sentenced to 27 years to life in prison. She became eligible for parole around 2006 and tried to file an appeal to get herself out of prison. Unfortunately for her, she would be denied parole as she was still found to very much be a threat and be too unpredictable to be out in public. She then became eligible again in 2011 and filed a second appeal, which was also denied because she never took full responsibility for the crime and she still was considered to be a little bit too unpredictable predictable for to get out of prison. She will not be eligible for parole again until 2026. Thank God. She is currently being held in the California Institution for Women. But the famous question that we always pose to ask, what exactly was her motive? Omaima was born in an unfortunate situation, being dealt a bad hand from the start. She was born into an abusive family and into poverty and had to grow up trying to do anything that it took to survive, including abuse sexual acts, humiliating sexual acts, and just humiliation in general to try to get by. She also did modeling, but that wasn't enough. Having to do whatever it takes to survive can really take its toll on somebody. And during her short marriage to Bill, which only lasted about three to four weeks in the duration of all of this, Bill apparently was sexually and physically abusive toward Amima. And as I mentioned before, he would sell her randomly to people for cash, for rent, and at one point, even a car. After suffering so much abuse and horror growing up, after being born in poverty, and after having to do everything that it took in order to get by, she had to have suffered some sort of PTSD, and then she just probably snapped on Bill. Who knows? Only Omaima. But here lies another question. If she apparently was just taking out her traumas, 
Why would she go and eat Bill? Why would she mutilate him so much? During her trial, she also claimed to be very tied to ancient Egyptian beliefs. And she thought that this was probably the only way she wouldn't have to meet Bill in the afterlife, as she was so afraid of meeting him in the afterlife after what she had done to him. According to ancient Egyptian beliefs, it is said that after one dies, their spiritual body goes on a perilous journey to the afterlife, and that is not guaranteed that you will get in. The journey itself to the afterlife was perilous, and you had to undergo several trials in order to even get into the afterlife. Omaima thought that if she mutilated him enough and chopped him up enough, it would impede his journey and make sure that he is unsuccessful on reaching the afterlife. She has been compared to the likes of Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs. But despite this, she somehow got remarried while incarcerated. And the only thing that she wants in life right now is to be free of prison so that she could go back to Egypt and live the rest of her life with her mother. But an event like this can leave a family traumatized. Poor Margaret had no idea that this would be the last time that she got to talk to her father Bill. And they didn't even have a body to mourn over really. How do you punish a person? that destroyed someone that you loved to the point that there was not much left of him at all to mourn over? Well, what do you do to the person that ate your loved one? Would things have turned out differently if Margaret and her family had actually decided to show up to Bill's dinner? Who knows? No one knows for sure, but as Margaret herself said, I don't know the adequate punishment for a murderer that leaves a family with no body to mourn over, but I do know that you don't let her out. Be thankful for your families, and show love to those who have lost loved ones over the holidays and have to go through a holiday without them. I really do hope that you guys have a wonderful and safe holiday season. I want you all to know that I'm very thankful for you guys, and I am so glad that you watch my videos, and I hope that you stick around for another episode. But until then, see you later. Take care and stay safe. Thanks for watching this episode of Gassy Vampire. Don't forget to subscribe and ring my bell so you don't miss more mysterious and macabre content. And also, check out my other channels like my music channel, my band, and my gaming Twitch and YouTube channels. More content is coming soon. Till next time guys, and don't forget to always summon your deepest fears.